Hello and welcome to In Bold, the podcast brought to you by Strategy and Middle East team. This is the second half of our conversation with our gaming experts, Alexandra and Johnny, where we've been lifting the lid on what's going on in the gaming industry. If you tuned in for the last episode, you'll remember that we opened up the topic, talked about the scale of the opportunity, and how that's impacting global businesses, global players, and specifically the Middle East region, how that's different. Today, we're going a bit deeper, and we're going to find out more about the trends and what's coming in the future. So guys, thanks for joining me again. I wondered if we could talk a bit more about some of the trends emerging within the gaming space. And we last time we briefly mentioned NFTs, it's something I hear a lot about. I'm not sure how significant that is to the gaming industry, but maybe you can tell me more. Let's just start with a basic definition of NFTs. Johnny, could you help us out with that? Okay, so an NFT or non-fungible token uh, is basically a, a digital asset. It's a unique, uh, one-of-a-kind digital asset that that belongs to uh, its owner, its uh, sole ownership, and uh, its mere existence on uh, on the blockchain. So it's it's like a, which is a form of a digital ledger, let's say. Uh, the existence uh, of it on this blockchain uh, proves uh, irrefutably that you are the owner of this digital asset. Uh, or NFT, and it could be anything uh, such as art or music or uh, audio, or whatever in-app game, uh, in-app swords, armors, uh, weapons, uh, you name it. So that's like a simple explanation as to what an NFT is. When you talk NFTs in general, you want you, you want the benefits that NFTs bring you versus versus how it's been done before. So you want the proof of ownership. You want the security that that it uh, that it allows you uh, online. The transparency that transactions that are happening they're actually happening and they cannot be be hacked. It opens up a whole new ball game. So you can use your NFT to earn while you're playing. Beyond just earning while playing, you can stake your NFT, which you paid for, and have someone else generate revenue off of it and do a revenue share of whatever earnings uh, your NFT actually actually provided. It's just opened up a possibility that you can actually live and work off of your digital assets in the in the metaverse. So uh, it's it's revolutionary, I think, in the way it changed how we look at gaming and uh, and digital ownership in general. Perfect, perfect. And Alexander, maybe asking you, how significant are NFTs for gaming? Is it the is it the next big thing? So in terms of uh, revenue opportunity for now, uh, it's still anecdotal, but it's uh, it's an innovation. Um, what I believe, though, is that it acts as a tip of the iceberg. And what I see as much more fundamental as a potential revolution in gaming is um, the blockchain gaming behind it. So meaning the fact that you can um, recognize the ownership by the players of um, virtual assets in games that those players can then trade or uh, keep for long term. And it also means that developers can uh, create new incentives for players to spend time in game, to level up, to uh, bring their friends in the game community. Uh, And that to me is much more significant and much more um, promising for the gaming ecosystem than the NFT itself. And am I right in thinking that, you know, previously you would, you know, um, earn a token or earn a prize, but it would stay largely within that sort of gaming ecosystem. Whereas I think one of the possibilities with NFTs is you can earn within one gaming ecosystem and then take that prize out and exchange it for, you know, other NFTs or even, you know, cryptocurrency or money and it opens the possibilities. I love your question, Jonathan, because I think that uh, what's at the core of the gaming industry right now and what explains why there is so much excitement is actually the fact that we don't know what's next in the in the industry. Uh, every year uh, keeps surprises us, uh, surprising us in terms of uh, the modus operandi of playing. Like, what will be the next platform? What will be the new geography? What will be the new monetization channel? What will be the new um, ownership model? It's an industry which keeps surprising us every single year, and that's why I, I love it. Uh, so, to answer to your point, Jonathan, uh, NFT is definitely a cool trend, but I. I for me, it's almost anecdotal. I, I would say that uh, it's the tip of the iceberg of what I perceive as a much more fundamental shift uh, in the industry, which is 
the Web3 gaming or whatever you want to call it, some, some people call it, call it crypto gaming. The perfect example of this trend right now is Axie Infinity. It is this game which was launched uh, quite recently and which, was, which is grabbing a lot of attention in the media. You have dozens of thousands who stopped working as Uber driver and they started spending all their time playing because it, the game relies on uh, a play to earn uh, model. So basically you can monetize your in-game uh, time. And I, I think that basically Web3 is, um, is completely creating new incentives to realign the interest between developers and players. Um, so in the past, basically, you had a monopoly of the in-game assets. You had a monopoly by the developer. What Web3 Gaming is doing is to give legal ownership to players over their in-game assets. And this mm -hmm. means that uh, you can uh, realign interests and incentives completely between developer and player. I can imagine a world where basically uh, as a developer, I can incentivize my players if they bring new players, if they spend more time, if they pass a level by giving them um, like a virtual currency, which can then be traded in real currency. So this uh, completely reinvents um, the, the wheel of gaming. And that makes me super, super excited. Um, Axie Infinity, I think it's just the beginning of this trend. Um, so the, the second trend which is exciting for me is basically uh, the geographic expansion. Um, so we talked about the $178 billion revenue. Uh, what's interesting beyond the growth of revenue is how it's split by region. Uh, we see that uh, North America and Europe are still growing, but at a slowing pace. Um, What's exciting is that Asia, Middle East, Africa are growing at a huge pace. And uh, that's uh, something which is going to continue. And as Johnny was mentioning earlier, it opens a lot of doors um, for developers. For example, the opportunity of uh, localizing or even culturizing uh, games. Uh, for example, you, you might be tempted to, to take an existing franchise or IP from the US and to make it more relevant for the Middle Eastern culture. And that's something which is being done uh, more and more often. And a trend after Web3 and uh, globalization. The third trend I would say um, is um, basically the new uh, platforms. So in the last few years, mobile has become de facto uh, the dominating uh, platform and uh, much more uh, revenues than PC and console. I think this is going to be uh, the case for the next few years, but I, I am very excited about cloud gaming. I think cloud gaming has the potential to add on top of the 3 billion existing players, one more billion. So cloud gaming, for those who don't know, it's basically a way to stream games, whatever your uh, hardware is, you can play Fortnite on your TV, on uh, your uh, tablet, on your PC, on your phone, and uh, the whole game is streamed from the cloud. So you have all the big tech companies which are already investing heavily in this direction. So from uh, Google with Stadia to uh, Amazon with Luna to the Chinese uh, big tech companies as well. And uh, this uh, could really make accessibility of gaming much bigger uh, in territories such as Africa or the Middle East uh, once the 5G is available, of course, in those regions. Last but not least, uh, so my last uh, trend revolves around the increasing uh, merger and morphing of gaming with other entertainment activities. So we've discussed, for example, the sandbox um, games such as Roblox or Fortnite, which uh, attract more and more musicians and sports activities. But I, there is another example which really attracted my attention in the last few weeks. It was a launch on Netflix of Arcane, uh, which is mm -hmm. uh, League of Legends, um, basically story. And Netflix decided to produce and to launch exclusively on its platform this uh, gaming um, show. And I was really impressed by the quality uh, of the show, but also by um, the, the very cool synergies between having like a platform of uh, video content and uh, having gaming franchise, uh, which, which is loved by uh, dozens of millions of players. And I think this is once again, just the beginning of this trend. Alexander, thanks so much for that. Super cool. I've, uh, I've taken copious notes on those four trends. I think that's, uh, that's super exciting. It's all, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's huge potential, but uh, it could go in any direction going forward. So how do the industry giants handle these dynamics? You know, how do the major players, the major participants um, navigate this constant evolution? So it's a tricky situation, I have to say, uh, Jonathan. Uh, 
mean, if you follow the news, you probably saw uh, late last year there was this big lawsuit between uh, Apple and Epic Games. And it was basically over the uh, quote-unquote the monopoly that, that Apple has on any type of uh, purchase happening on an, uh, on an iOS device uh, and their revenue share agreements with the developers. So there was no clear winner, I would say. But this is something, uh, this is a clear example of, of how big players are, uh, are interacting and how they are in conflict, I believe. Uh, and this, I think this will open up, adding to, adding to a trend uh, uh, to what Alexander said, this is, is something to watch in the future around, uh, you know, how will developers and distributors uh, compete for a share of wallet from, from customers? So uh, mm-hmm. will, will Apple maintain their, their, uh, their dominance on, on payment channels and in-app purchase specifically, or, or will the developers actually try to bypass these uh, first party store payments. And so this is something uh, to look forward to. Uh, another thing is uh, the role of regulators. So it's, it's, it's the wild west kind of these days, <laughs> especially with uh, web 3.0, the decentralization of gaming and, uh, and like your ownership of your uh, digital assets, etc. So w- how can regulation enable this whole ecosystem to, to grow as opposed to uh, hindering it? And there have been a lot of efforts, especially on the esports front, I believe, uh, in order to create these you know, international committees that govern esports or that govern gaming at large. But it's uh, really the power for now is in the hands of the developers. They own the games. They, they steer the games. So... But again, regulators are regulators. They have they have power. They can restrict. They can uh, they can block or bypass. So uh, that trend is going to be also out there in terms of how regulators will interact with, on one hand, the the developers and the distributors, and on the other hand, as well, the uh, the consumers. So we've seen in China how the the Chinese government basically put a put a curfew or a limit as to how many hours a day. Uh, kids, people can can play, and this has massive repercussions on the valuations of these uh, big uh, big gaming developers and uh, and distributors. So just with you know one announcement, a regulator or a, or a government can slash out billions and destroy uh, you know a lot of uh, economic value uh, uh, out there in the gaming world or anywhere. So this is also something uh, to look out for when you discuss dynamics between industry giants and the regulators. Fascinating. I, I couldn't agree more with Johnny on the, um, on the app store and the app distribution in general on mobile. Uh, I think this is a space which is um, huge in terms of revenue and profitability for the giants, uh, Google and Apple. But um, because of a set of um, drivers, this is a space which is ripe for disruption. Um, the data company Newzoo uh, estimates that um, the third party distribution of games, so everything which is not Google and Apple, is going to increase um, from uh, 17% to 24% of global revenue um, by 2025. So I think that it's going to become a much more competitive space. Um, and this is related to the increasing uh, push from the regulators towards more competition. Um, another reason is that um, some developers such as Roblox are just too, too big to fail. So basically they have too much success um, in terms of engagement and revenue. And basically the negotiation power between uh, app stores um, on the one hand and the developer on the other hand is, is starting to shift. Uh, you you feel it, and that's why you you can. I mean, Roblox now is uh, is still on the App Store, even though they are de facto violating the conditions of the App Store um, policy. Uh, supposedly, you are not allowed to to have games within an app, uh, like uh, what uh, Apple Store uh, calls uh, an App Store in an App Store. Uh, but Roblox, they still had the, the option to do it. A similar story with Netflix. Um, normally, you are not supposed to be able to advertise uh, and to um, distribute games within an app offered uh, on the App Store. And uh, as you've probably seen in the news uh, recently, Netflix is now including em- embedding uh, links to download its uh, own games uh, from within the Netflix app. 
And uh, once again, this is because just Netflix is too big to be excluded from the App Store or from Google Play. And it can be compared a bit to Coca-Cola in retail. Uh, if you are Carrefour or uh, Waitrose, you, you are going to probably uh, want to avoid the risk of Coca-Cola refusing to come to your supermarket because you will lose a lot of customers if you don't have Coca-Cola. Roblox is becoming this equivalent on the App Store. Um, when it comes to uh, your larger question, Jonathan, which is basically about um, the, the big tech motivation in general, so it's quite clear that everyone is going in the same direction. So all the big tech companies, without exception, are investing in gaming. Um, so either uh, like through first party investments, like uh, by building uh, business lines um, from inside the company or through M&A. Um, but to me, in addition to the regulatory risk that Johnny has already mentioned, there is a more uh, clear risk in my mind, which is how different uh, the, the capabilities are in gaming versus the traditional business of these big tech companies is. Uh, I'm going to take the example of Google and uh, so Google a few years ago, so they invested massively in Stadia. So Stadia was supposed to become the Netflix of gaming for Google. They attracted a lot of very senior people from the industry. Uh, it was billions of investments. Um, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet, uh, attended uh, the launch of the product on stage, a huge PR activity. And it was revealed like um, last year that uh, Google was going to cancel the first party studios uh, investments. And this is a perfect illustration of how difficult it is for a big tech company, which is huge in manpower and revenue, to, to stick to what it takes to succeed in gaming. Gaming, it's a long-term investment. It's um, a lottery uh, game. Basically, it's a really a hit-driven business. You can uh, reap the benefits from your efforts only years after you started your work. It's different level of talent, different level of technology, different tech stack. And... Um, you need to make sure that your executives, that your shareholders are patient enough to reap the benefits from your efforts. And it's only very few companies which will see the end of these efforts. Uh, we know that Disney uh, also has uh, canceled its um, gaming uh, efforts in-house. They announced that their strategy would be now to license their IPs instead of building their own games. So we will see who will be the winner, but it is a very tough um, transition for these big tech companies and very few of them will succeed, uh, I expect. Huge opportunity, but very difficult to make work. Very difficult for an outside player to come and, uh, and, and be successful in the gaming space. Yeah, following up on this, actually, you mentioned a very good, uh, uh, let's say, dilemma that these big tech players are, are facing, Alexander. They all want to be in gaming. Clearly, we can see this in their massive acquisitions, their announcements, uh, be it in-house or... Uh, inorganic JVs, etc. Uh, they're trying to monetize at the end of the day and uh, it, it often fails. We've seen it with Google Stadia, as you mentioned. And another, uh, another let's say, uh, a hiccup that I, that I kind of like foresee in 2022 is uh, the efforts uh, by these big tech players to, to kind of like turn gaming into a subscription model, similar to the Netflixes of the, of the world, basically. Uh, this so Microsoft already have their Xbox uh, Game Pass and Nintendo are trying to do it with their Switch Online. Uh, others are trying to follow suit, PlayStation, etc. It's been there for a while now, but it hasn't really taken off because the economics are quite quite challenging. I mean, big tech players, as you mentioned, it's not clear if they have the stamina and the patience to launch hit, uh, game after game and refine the hits and phase out the the misses. And subscription gaming is a way to bundle all of these games in one service that you spend, uh, you pay per month, and that's it. But, you know, games are, are costly to make. And uh, you sell games like these AAA hits for 50, 60, 70 bucks uh, a copy. So which subscription model is going to merge all of these hits in, in one subscription? The economics are quite tricky. To your point on cloud gaming, it's, it, it's not only tricky from the developer's point of view, but also on the, the technology and the infrastructure. So, uh, so the problem it's trying to solve is to become less dependent on advanced hardware. However, you're dependent on quite advanced uh, infrastructure from your telecom operators, uh, be it the ultra high speeds or low latencies in order to, to be able to play a game hiccup free with no lags. 
And mm. this is also quite challenging, especially with these super fast-paced uh, online multiplayer games. A, milli, a nanosecond uh, of delay and, and, and you're dead. Cloud gaming kind of like shifted the, the bottleneck to the infrastructure uh, as opposed to having it on the device. And that's also been proving challenging to navigate. So there's another dynamic between your infrastructure providers and uh, and the governments in and funding these massive projects as well, as we see in, in Saudi, for example. Uh, on one hand, and your developers uh, actually making the games uh, cloud gaming friendly as opposed to uh, native on your devices. Excellent. Thanks so much. So final question to each of you. What's your advice, given everything you know and everything we've talked about today, what's your advice for someone who wants to get into the gaming market? I would say that um, it's very different from 10 years ago because the barrier to entry has become uh, much higher. It's become a very competitive space. You need uh, to have a very uh, unique positioning in the market to be perceived, to be recognized, to be downloaded, to be played and to monetize. So you need to make sure that you have something which makes you unique and which brings attention from the player community. So it can be a great product. I was referring to Royal Match. Uh, mm -hmm. So Royal Match, it's a match three. Everyone thought that basically everything which could be done has been already done. And they proved that uh, you can still optimize uh, on this genre. And they are, uh, they are having a huge success in the last few months. Uh, you can also like uh, reinvent completely uh, how um, the relationship between developers and users is. So that's the case of Axie Infinity and the Web3 uh, trend. You can um, adopt the aggregator model. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what companies such as uh, Embracer and Steelfront, so I'm doing a bit of advertising, uh, are doing. <laughs> so it's basically um, uh, buying uh, studios and trying to put in place synergies um, to make sure that you can generate revenues in a more competitive way versus the other uh, competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and last but not least, you can, um, you can also try to create synergies with ad tech solutions. So that's uh, the solution, which, which uh, the strategy which is being adopted by companies such as Iron Source or AppLovin. So uh, by creating synergies between having game studios and also having like ad tech technology. Mm -hmm. Super. Johnny, any thoughts from you? Any any other words of advice? I'll give a more Middle Eastern uh, perspective. I think there's a significant lack of local content and interested parties who want to venture into gaming in the in this region. Uh, there's the, the opportunity is vast. Find a few good ideas, develop legitimate MVPs, roll them out, test them with your early subscriber base, refine them. Uh, focus a lot on marketing. I definitely agree with Alexandre. Even though it's been it's as decentralized as ever, however, you're crowded out. There is a lot of uh, supply globally, uh, so there is a lot of uh, noise in terms of people actually finding your game, be it global or region. Find a couple of uh, niches that are untapped in the region, Arabic content, Middle Eastern settings, uh, you know, the chapters, the the actual maps, etc. There's a lot of demand for this, and uh, I think you would be tapping into something uh, unserved yet. Alexandre, Johnny, I can't thank you enough for everything you've shared over the last two episodes. I've certainly learned a lot, and I mean, as always, there's so much more I want to ask you guys, but, but that's all we have time for today. I'll be following this topic going forward, and I'll be fascinated to see how it develops and the impact it has on the Middle East region. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on these conversations. It's really great to have you with us. If you've enjoyed the discussion, please do subscribe to the channel. And while you're there, leave us a review. Next episode, we'll be looking in detail at the esports market, what it is, how we see it developing, and how it could empower the Middle East region going forward. So see you on the next episode of InBold. <laughs>